Welcome to Word of Mouth, where dentists talk about how oral health is related to overall health, which is also known as the oral systemic connection. The information provided on this video is not intended as medical advice and should not be interpreted as such. If you seek medical advice, please consult with a healthcare professional. Also, the information in this video represents the thoughts of the individual speakers and the views expressed in this interview do not necessarily reflect the views of the IAOMT. Hello, welcome to another episode of our podcast, Word of Mouth, uh, presented by the IOMT. My name is Jack Call. I'm a long-term member of the IOMT, and I have here with me today Dr. Thomas Levy. And uh, Dr. Levy, just tell us a little bit about yourself. I was, I guess, what you call a mainstream cardiologist some 25 years ago until I met Dr. Hal Huggins, and my whole medical and healthcare universe became topsy-turvy. So I spent a lot of time with Dr. Huggins. I discontinued my cardiology practice. I actually went to law school. And I noticed early on in Dr. Huggins's practice phenomenal things taking place with patients after they'd had a whole extensive period of arduous extractions and problems. I said, Hal, how can these patients possibly look so good after going through such torture? And he just pointed at the IV bag. I said, okay, fine, IV bag. That helps me a lot. He said, it's what's in it. And what's in it was 50 grams of vitamin C. I'd never heard anything like that in my life. But at that instant, I said, well, this is something that I have to research for myself. That began my research pathway, expanded me along the lines of focal infections and toxicities, different forms of vitamin C, the applications, which to a large degree are still ignored today. And so that's the whole point of why we're getting together is to try to get this word out so that patients, in my humble opinion, can get real medical care uh, and not just be pharmacologically have their pockets picked. So, uh, and most recently, I'm on the magnesium bandwagon. I have a book coming out, Magnesium Reversing Disease. And something I thought I'd never say is that the most important supplement is not vitamin C, it's magnesium. I wouldn't have expected that from you. <clears throat> Point being is magnesium deficiency underlies virtually every disease and virtually every person as a provoking and aggravating uh, and exacerbating factor. And the only thing that can substitute or take care of that is magnesium. On the other hand, if you're severely depleted of vitamin C, you can't be made whole with other antioxidants, but you can be partially compensated for with other antioxidants. So absolutely, you still need vitamin C and lots of it, but if you had to absolutely give up one or the other one, I'd say you don't want to give up magnesium because nothing can, can undo the damage that a magnesium deficiency does except magnesium. So you mentioned earlier about the focal infection, which is what's your main um, title of your presentation with us here at this conference is about. So if we could, let's zoom out a little bit and just talk about what focal infection means. What, tell us a little bit about the concept and the, and the history of that. When, when did that come about? Well, of course, the real concept of focal infection, although it's been present maybe for centuries, really came into focus with Dr. Weston Price and his work. And the fact that whether you like the news or not, all root canals are infected and the work of Dr. Boyd Haley proved that. It's a question though, body-wise, of how well your body copes with the infection. Yes. Some people a root canal will kill with a heart attack in six months and other people will have a root canal for three decades and do fine. That's what's so puzzling and confusing is, is what then influences that. And so that's what you talk about. Right. And, and the other thing to do to, to sort of expand the category, when we talk about infections, I think it's, I sort of put it in three categories. You have a generalized infection, like the flu, like a viral infection, like Ebola, like Lyme, like anything, acute or chronic, but it's generalized. Then you have the focal infection, which might be an abscess tooth or, or focal infection in your tonsils or gums. And then finally, something that 
to my knowledge, has not been really recognized as an entity unto itself, but I hope to introduce this concept, if you will, with this presentation, is what I call pathogen colonization, okay? It's not an abscess, it's not a generalized bodily infection, but it's pathogens continuing to proliferate at a low level, oftentimes protected by a biofilm, so you never really get a chance to completely eradicate them, yet they're generating toxins, as the expression goes these days, 24-7. And although you can have pathogen colonization just about anywhere in the body, and one of the most common areas is the coronary artery, which is why you get coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, heart attacks, the most common area is the nasopharynx, okay, and the upper respiratory airways. And we're also seeing that there's now an increasing amount of literature that's showing the chronic swallowing of these pathogens 24-7 is one of the major contributors to why so many people have so much problem with their bowels and their GI tract. I mean, you're swallowing nonstop pro-oxidant toxins and pathogen breakdown products when you have a chronic colonization in your upper airways and you haven't effectively gotten rid of it. And the more I've gotten into this, the more I've realized, to my satisfaction, hasn't been proved yet, is that once these pathogens colonize and take hold and have their biofilms, unless you really have a specific directed way to break down that biofilm, you've got it for life. You've got it for life. Uh, and we just sort of accept the sinus problem and the drip and the cough and the, this, and, and the bad breath. I think... Horrible, funky breath is, for most people, uh, and it may have started, they may not have had that, let's say, six months ago, but they had a cold or a flu, knocked out all the normal flora, got pathogens to grow in there, never knocked it out completely, got the biofilm overgrowth, and now they have the chronic putrid breath of, of pathogens proliferating. So <clears throat> going into all of that, uh, not only looking at the pathogen colonization, but also some other factors we can talk about. Uh, actually make it possible for you to coexist with your focal infections without them bringing you down. So the modulation that you talk right. about right. Um, with various, uh, I guess, techniques or supplements. And obviously with a generalized infection, a focal infection or a colonization, the best thing is if you can get rid of it, no doubt about it. So if you have an infected tooth or you have a root canal, the best thing for the guarantee of your optimal long-term health is to get that thing out of there. Now, there are a lot of circumstances under which somebody doesn't want it taken out, won't give the dentist permission to take it out and say, but do what's best for me without taking out the tooth. And you know, in dentistry, we've been in the mode of saving teeth. That's the dogma that's ingrained to us in our training in dental schools and actually our society. You know, when you think about it, everybody wants a great smile. Uh, I mean, there's jokes about uh, where I'm from in Kentucky, you know, as far as how many teeth you have and that kind of thing. So it's, I think it's looked on as um, so critically important to maintain all your teeth despite uh, these concerns. And, and that's something very difficult for people to, to work through. So, no, so many dental practice are, you know, keep a healthy smile. It's all about cosmetic. And cosmetic's important. Nobody, nobody wants to look like they can eat corn on a cob through a picket wire fence, you know. They, they want to have something presentable. But Given the options, most people want their health optimal, even a little bit more than that. And so you try to find the balance between the two. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, then this, this modulation concept of um, trying to perhaps, I don't know if this is the right way to phrase it, but um, try to improve the, the biological terrain, the host resistance, if those are appropriate terms to use, uh, or, or is, is it something else you'd prefer to describe? Well, I've, I've, to my found, to my satisfaction, it all comes down to oxidative stress. Yes. And 
the degree to which you have increased above physiological levels because there's physiological oxidative stress i mean yeah oh yeah okay. i mean uh, above to physiological be alive, you levels have to have, yeah. what is that oxidative stress doing pathologically to your body and mm. what can you do to modulate it and let me backtrack first and say because i think this is extremely important and is not really realized as well as it should be as we talk about oxidative stress and disease and it's true. You see oxidative stress with disease, and you see a disease with oxidative stress, and they're always partners. Well, oxidative stress means more an abnormal number of biomolecules, RNA, DNA, proteins, lipids, structural proteins, uh, enzymes, are oxidized. They've lost electrons then they're reduced. They have normal electrons. When a biomolecule is, has not lost electrons, it's normal, 100% mm -hmm. normal, and it will have 100% normal function. Mm -hmm. When it's oxidized and loses one or more electrons, it either completely becomes afunctional or severely reduced in its normal mm -hmm. function, and that is disease. And, and, and it's that simple. And what you're describing are free radicals, correct? free radicals causing the oxidative damage. But the point being is there's not a single disease that's anything more than a unique array of oxidized biomolecules in different locations, in different tissues, uh, to a different degree, different enzymes. The only pathological change causing the disease is the oxidation of the biomolecule. It's just that the biomolecules involved could be billions or trillions and in different arrays, but the primary, well not the primary, the only pathophysiological insult is that the biomolecule is oxidized. <clears throat> so then that brings us to the point of disease is oxidation. It's not caused by oxidation, it is oxidation, okay? Small, maybe a small point, but I think an important point to latch on to is that you oxidize enough in the wrong areas, that's your disease. You don't, you don't have some sort of magical Alzheimer's process infiltrating your neurons or, or Parkinson's or cirrhotic liver. This, it's all oxidized biomolecules. <clears throat> now, so that brings us to what I call the two main prongs, or what should be the two main prongs of treatment. One is to prevent new oxidation, and the other is to repair old oxidation, okay? Prevention, that comes down to what we're talking about, focal infection. Infections anywhere are your primary cause, total volume-wise around the planet, for increased oxidative stress in people, infection. Whether you've identified it or not, <clears throat> secondarily, you might have a unique exposure to some environmental toxin and this, that, or the other, but all toxins inflict their damage by causing, by directly oxidizing something or causing it to be oxidized. So prooxidant and toxin are synonyms. They mean the same thing. <clears throat> so then, Great supplementation and anything you can do to increase antioxidant capacity in the tissues and start reducing oxidized myomolecules, that's your therapy, okay? But the most important thing, and Dr. Huggins taught me this many, many, many years ago when I was talking about trying to make someone better and I wasn't talking about what was causing it, and he sort of got frustrated with me and he said, Tom, I said, yes, sir said, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. That's a great, great, I great. said, wow. Yeah. I mean, and you can't cure a disease until you stop what's causing the disease to be sustained. Same thing. So, <clears throat> finding and addressing these infections, and there's a lot of asymptomatic infected teeth, root canals, infected tonsils, most tonsils, vast majority of tonsils that are present in a mouth that's had root canals or asymptomatic abscessed teeth for not that much time, maybe six months to a year, no more, 
the tonsils become chronically abscessed and infected, and even after you remove those teeth, the tonsils stay that way, even though they appear morphologically normal. So now, would, is, would an individual have symptoms of these no, chronically infected? No, no, that's, that's the bugger about this, yeah. okay? And it's a whole other story, but it's turning out Dr. Malika, Dr. Harris, doing uh, direct intratonsillar injections of ozone might finally be a way to help tonsils heal themselves <clears throat> without directly going to tonsillectomy, which, take my word for it, is one of the most miserable things you can do to yourself as an adult. Okay. So, those, you have environmental exposures, and then you have what the <sighs> hiding in plain sight sorts of oxidative stress, which I call the three toxic nutrients, calcium, iron, and copper. You need all three of them for life, and if you get above a certain level of them, they kill you, or they make you sick, yeah. okay? So, and there's not many things like that. I mean, you know, you, you can't overdo vitamin C, okay? But, uh, uh, well, the, the iron is a whole other story. But anyway, those are sources of oxidative stress, so you need to address that. And then, finally, the things that come into really important play are hormones, okay? Hormones are important, in my opinion, for two primary reasons. They accelerate desirable physiological processes, number one, and number two, by their very nature, they minimize accumulative oxidative stress. Even though hormones do many different things, I will maintain that they all share those two qualities. Well, of course, the number two is the biggie, modulating oxidative stress and minimizing oxidative stress. Estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, insulin, and hydrocortisone all decrease oxidative stress. <clears throat> now, more specifically, and this is what I'll get into in the talk, or I've gotten into in the talk, is that to really bring it down to a simple, com simple but accurate common denominator is that 100% of disease is increased intracellular oxidative stress. Well, I so, noticed that that caught my eye when you made that distinction about intracellular. So I'm really curious I mean, why you can, why you, you can have an abnormal, out of balance extracellular system, but that yeah. can't exist if the intracellular is normal. Okay. Okay, okay. then you, you, you have, so one begets the other. Okay. If you can normalize the intracellular downstream, you've taken care of the extracellular as well. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned this earlier, if a cell that's part of a diseased tissue or organ, it, in order for it to contribute to that disease, it has to have increased intracellular oxidative stress. And when you have cancer, it goes even higher, mm -hmm. okay? When, by whatever mechanisms, you can bring that increased oxidative stress to normal physiological levels, that cell is normal. Okay. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. And if you've done that to a large majority of the diseased uh, cells mm -hmm. and the diseased tissues, you've cured the disease. Mm -hmm. That's simple. So, um, <clears throat> as it turns out, in reviewing the literature, uh, another book I wrote, Death by Calcium, shows that, and the, ex the literature is extensive, that all increased intracellular oxidative stress is caused by and marked by, it's both the cause and the marker, of increased intracellular calcium, mm -hmm. period. Excess calcium is one of the worst things you can possibly do to your body, okay? Thus the title of the book, Death by Calcium. Mm -hmm. Now, anything you can do to pull calcium out or displace calcium is going to lower that increased oxidative stress and you'll start to approach normal. <clears throat> Magnesium is the direct biological antagonist and competitor to calcium. You can't have high levels of both, you can't have low levels of both. If one highs the other low, and vice versa. So, 
Magnesium not only blocks the physiological roles of calcium, it physiologically blocks the channels by which calcium is taken up into the cell. Well, that just answers my question that I was wondering, well, why would somebody have too much calcium intracellularly? And because of a for magnesium two, deficiency. The, the magne for two reasons. Yeah. They take it in too much calcium and they're okay. not taking in enough magnesium. Exactly. Okay. Or more importantly, not assimilating enough magnesium. So the more magnesium you get in there, mm -hmm. the lower the calcium goes. The more you bring vitamin C in, the more you minimize the oxidative stress and facilitate that process. You have really four things, primary things that control or mark your intracellular oxidative stress. That's magnesium, calcium, vitamin C, and glutathione. Mm -hmm. Now glutathione is important, but it's sort of a secondary player because there's nothing you're really going to do that I know of in my research that's going to specifically increase glutathione while not doing anything anything else inside. Basically, it's only when you start to normalize by the other mechanisms, intracellular oxidative stress, that glutathione levels start to come back to normal. So they're a secondary reflection of a normal intracellular status rather than the primary cause of it. Okay, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you bring magnesium in, you bring vitamin C in, intracellular stress comes down, glutathione is then free to synthesize normally, and you have a completely normal cell. Okay, so what impacts those things? Estrogen, testosterone, uh, thyroid, mm -hmm. these all have calcium channel blocking abilities, okay. number one. So they're, they all directly impact calcium. Uh, and incidentally, they all decrease all-cause mortality, which means they're impacting every okay. cell in a similar fashion, not just one disease process. And although estrogen and testosterone are important and should never be neglected, uh, thyroid is really the master control of oxidative stress. And this was proven empirically, if you will, by Dr. Broda Barnes, okay. He had some, I think 20,000 patients, it's either 2,000 or 20,000, mm -hmm. big difference. But anyway, uh, no, uh, 1,500 to 2,000. Mm -hmm. And he had his own way of detecting hypothyroidism with temperature and a few other things, very good. And he found that most people had minimal hypothyroidism. Okay, regular thyroid tests mm -hmm. do two things. They detect hyperthyroidism and they detect massive hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. They absolutely are insensitive to the most important epidemic, which is minimal subclinical right. hypothyroidism. Okay. And it appears that it's this important because of its effect on oxidative stress. When Dr. Barnes was able to use his protocol to normalize thyroid function, normalize body temperature, out of his 1,500 or so patients, at over a 20-year period, that's where the 20 came in, oh, okay. 1,500 patients over a 20-year period, four of them had heart attacks. Wow. And all four, he, he reflected, I didn't use enough thyroid. Hmm. Okay, now, these 1,500 patients, they had root canals, they had hypertension, mm -hmm. they had diabetes, they had, I mean, they were not a specially selected group okay. of patients. They had all the array of diseases that everybody has in the same amount, same degree, same mm -hmm. quantity, yet adjusting the thyroid function gave them almost a complete protection against a heart attack, which means it gave them a complete protection against the dissemination of a focal infection into the lining of the coronary artery, which I'm gonna tell you underlies all heart attacks. Yeah. If not all heart attacks, then 95, 96%, okay? Hmm. okay? And he also found when people dropped out of the study, the heart attacks started kicking up again, okay? A whole bunch dropped out, 30 people. Now, the other thing is that figure four. With 1,500 adult patients, in a similar population, they looked at the Framingham study, nearly 80 patients should have had heart attacks during that period. Hmm. So four to 80. Now, um, 
So adjustment of the thyroid function is of paramount importance. But other things of importance now, we'll go back to the magnesium and the vitamin C are, uh, estrogen and testosterone are extremely important and they should be normalized in everybody. Right. I mean, if you, have, if you think you have a person that's too old to normalize their testosterone or estrogen, then they're too old to treat, <laughs> okay. okay? Now, you're much more delicate. You don't, you don't push a low testosterone in an 85-year-old man to a high normal. You go for a low to mid-range of normal. You don't want to put rocket fuel mm -hmm. in a Model T, mm -hmm. okay? So that's very critical too. Now, insulin, fascinating, fascinating hormone. Um, after my own personal extensive research, it's my opinion that the only thing that, by, the only thing that insulin does with regard to glucose is facilitate its uptake into the cell. I, don't, I can't find anything that tells me inside the cell insulin has some magic metabolic mm -hmm. effect. All it is is the thing that pushes or pulls by, uh, glucose into the cell. By the same route, it pulls vitamin C into the cell. Glucose and vitamin C are competitive. So we know that insulin plays a great salutary role by pulling vitamin C into the cell, but insulin also massively pulls magnesium into the cell. Uh -huh. Okay. How long have we known that? Is that uh, more recently understood? I don't or? know when the literature came out. I, okay. I came across it a few months ago. I don't know. Okay. okay. Uh, and I think I mentioned this, but let me reemphasize it. There's 10,000 times more magnesium inside the cell than outside the cell. 10,000 mm, times. That's a big ratio. So that's a major gradient that's being overcome right, right. to get more magnesium inside Absolutely. a cell. Yeah. And that's what insulin does. <sighs> It's amazing, they have a whole host of studies, double blind, prospective, placebo controlled, massive series, large patients, human beings, wound care, insulin, both topically and systemically, massively accelerate quality healing. Mm -hmm. But how many wound centers around the world routinely use insulin? Mm -hmm. Maybe none? Yeah, that'd okay. be my guess. So, and this is one thing that frustrates me a great deal is there's so much information that's been discovered and it's never used. Now, I'm not going to get into the politics of why it might or might not be used, but, but we, have, we have the answers if we want to use them. Okay, so insulin does that. Hydrocortisone. Oh, so I'm going to let me one more point about insulin. My opinion about insulin, my opinion, is that its role with magnesium and vitamin C is more important than its role with glucose. Okay. Now, hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone is considered, I think, maybe the most potent anti-inflammatory there is, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty close. All right. <clears throat> what is inflammation? Inflammation is an area that has lost its antioxidant, mostly vitamin C, and that inflammation stimulates an immune response. And the first cell to show up for that immune response is the monocyte, which has 80-fold more vitamin C inside it than the serum. So I'm going to tell you that the primary role of the immune system is to deliver antioxidant capacity where it's been acutely depleted and to continue to exert that effect until the antioxidant capacity rises, which is why you have chronic inflammatory responses because if nothing ever changes in the patient's supplement or, or diet to bring more antioxidants in, you're never going to quell the inflammation secondary to the antioxidant depletion. And then the chronic inflammatory response gives you all these collagen vascular diseases and all these other things and then what do they try to do they try to give you drugs to suppress your immune system okay <clears throat> well the mechanism by which hydrocortisone exerts its function in my opinion and we have some data and the rest is my conclusion is hydrocortisones in my opinion primary 
almost sole function, but primary function, is that it's designed to pull vitamin C inside the cell. That's it. Okay. We also know if you study the literature, there's nothing more potent as an anti-inflammatory than vitamin C. So really, it's just the hydrocortisone fighting inflammation by, via its ability to pull vitamin C inside the high oxidative stress cells. <clears throat> so, um, the point to all this then for keeping focal infections focal is that keep in mind what disease is, the increased intracellular oxidative stress is associated with it, the factors that bring it down and normalize it, and the reasons why focal infections metastasize. Um, in a similar fashion, because cancers have extremely high oxidative stress, and the more metastatic a cancer is, the more oxidative stress is involved in the cancer cells until they reach that final threshold where they die, Adjusting your thyroid function also keeps cancers input. Cancers, in many ways, you can visualize as the metastasis of a cancer is like the metastasis of a focal infection, and they both occur for the same reason. They set up site and lock in on areas where the oxidative stress is out of control. That's their fertile territory where they can take hold. When that's under control, they've got nowhere to go. They just got to stay put. Okay. I want to go back to, to estrogen, uh, particularly in, in situations in which there's breast cancer that's estrogen positive, that as far as traditional onco oncological techniques of, or principles of treating uh, breast cancer, which you know, we probably <laughs> have a lot of issues with, but as far as the approach of using uh, agents that decrease the amount of estrogen production in the body, then that would seem to just totally backfire based on, on what I'm learning here, that uh, you're creating then this reduction of estrogen, which is very important. So is there any way to try to reconcile those two other than just abandoning uh, that traditional approach to... Well, it's what you're following. I mean, if what you're doing is reducing oxidative stress, and you can document it, like with Broda Barnes, well, he didn't do this particular, but bringing elevated reverse T3 levels down to normal and normalizing that ratio, and you're normalizing your oxidative stress, that's not the milieu in which a cancer can, can, uh, can proliferate. Um, there's a lot of positive and negative influences, mishmash involved in how you contract and develop different cancers, mm. okay? But uh, there's no way I would deprive a woman of estrogen who has any type of breast cancer if her levels were below normal, not low normal, but below normal, because that causes everything else to get out of balance. Uh, by in and of itself, it increases all-cause mortality. Now, the one thing I need to jump on right here really quick is the primary cause of breast cancers is focal infections in the mouth, and you can see this on the thermograms coming down into the breasts. We have studies that show the lesions in, in cancerous breasts have periodontal pathogens in them. Surprise, surprise. But once again, this is, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. Mm -hmm. So don't just repair, prevent as well, okay? And once you, so you don't do one thing at a time. You do everything all at once, okay? You don't just say, well, let's do this part. Let's do a little magnesium. Let's do a little vitamin C. Let's, let's look for an infection in the mouth. Let's uh, uh, use, uh, what, what is it, pulse electromagnetic field mm -hmm. therapy, okay. whatever. You need a coordinated approach, and all of it needs to be designed toward uh, reducing oxidative stress inside the cells while at the same time 
stopping the factors that keep it going, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> a lot of women do well with both traditional chemotherapy mm -hmm. and other agents early on. Oh, I'm, I'm cancer free. And then it comes back a year or two later, or they get mm -hmm. another malignancy a year or two later. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't really a successful therapy, was it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to get rid of the factor that caused it to come in the first, the first place. place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So getting back to, to then a, a more preventive approach uh, before the disease starts, let's say that a, a younger person uh, uh, in their 20s and uh, they're, they're learning a little bit about, you know, taking care of, better care of themselves. They're kind of getting beyond that, that age of thinking they're going to live forever. And they're getting more health conscious. Um, tell us uh, if there's any of those listeners here, uh, what, what would be some basic recommendations? Uh, you know, where do you, where do you start with this Good stuff? Question. And <clears throat> basically, Quality supplementation, you're never too young for that, and that's a whole huge subject all by itself. But because of the role that focal inflections play and the extremely common nature of them, it's not limited to old people. Any, I don't care what, it, what age it is, if they're five years old and they've got leukemia, they need a 3D cone beam exam of the mouth. Okay. Okay, because... Kids at that age can fracture a tooth and have an asymptomatic abscess just as easily as anybody else. And if you don't identify that abscess and get that tooth out, the long-term outlook mm -hmm. of that child is not great. Okay. Okay. So, and this was the main purpose of my book, Hidden Epidemic, where I'm looking at the 2D versus the 3D, is to promote the concept that the 3D cone beam examination should be a routine part of any initial medical evaluation for anything. Mm -hmm. Just as much as a glucose or a CBC or a biochem panel or anything else. Because nothing is going to find an asymptomatic infected tooth that doesn't hurt and doesn't mm -hmm. show up on a regular x-ray but for this study. Yes. And then let's say you have that study, you're a young person, 20 years old, mm -hmm. and it looks fine. Great. That's now in your file. And if, let's say, when you're 30 years old, oh, you get a little dizzy or something, you go in and your blood sugar is 300, well, yeah, you need the blood sugar treated, maybe insulin, maybe diet, but you need to have that test repeated yes. to see if an infected tooth has popped up in the meantime. Yes. So. I consider it, it should be incorporated as a routine part of medical evaluation and both medical and dental follow-up because <clears throat> even though we know all root canals are infected, some root canals, especially if your thyroid function is in good, good check, mm -hmm. are much more stable than others. Mm -hmm. And maybe your CRP will stay normal. Well, let's say your CRP starts creeping up, 2.53, 3.5, and maybe the thyroid functions okay well time to redo the 3d and see if the space around the root canal is mm -hmm. plumped up to a much larger uh, abscess in which case and the endodontist would agree with disagree with me here because they want to do root canals forever but definitely after a root canal has failed it needs to come out right okay you, you, it's, it's almost like it's a challenge for them. I can do it right this time. Yeah, well, if you don't do it right, you've exposed this patient to another year, year and a half, two years, three years of unnecessary infective toxicity throughout our body right. just to prove that you could do it right the second time. Right. I mean, if, if you're a highly trained, high-volume endodontist, you should only get one bite at the apple if you get that bite at all. And although... I would add that there are new technologies coming along that uh, some people feel will make for a safer root canal. Now that remains to be seen. Right. You know, do the, I don't do deny the we, we have a dearth of studies. We yes. need a lot more studies, 
looking at the parameters of oxidative right. stress, CRP, reverse yeah. T3, X-ray yeah. picture, yeah. the overall ball of wax. But it, it emphasizes then when that new root canal is done for the first time on a tooth, if somebody chooses to take that path, that you maximize the chance of success by getting to uh, a dentist trained with these newer Absolutely. technologies. Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing I'm against more than a general dentist doing two or three root canals a week rather than going to the endodontist right. that does 30 a week. And I'm a general dentist, but I stopped doing root canal therapies many right. years ago, partly because of that. You know, all, all the fields in healthcare yeah. and in our culture have become so much more specialized. And it's hard uh, to be a jack of all trades. <laughs> it really is. So. Uh, so in respect to the, the, the knowledge base. And the but I want to emphasize set. this, and, and I think this is obvious, but let me point it out. Mm -hmm. This means that dentists and docs need to start working together. Well, yeah, now, a lot true. of the dentists are going to say, well, all that sounds great, but, you know, I can't be looking at this blood work, that blood work. Well, that's fine. Yeah. Not asking you to practice medicine, but make an effort to get to know one or two or three integrative medicine colleagues, yes. have lunch with them, see if they're on board with these concepts, yes. and make sure these patients start getting referred to that doctor to get followed up on their reverse T3 and their mm -hmm. T3 and their CRP and their hormone status, et cetera. Well, that's one of the things that the IOMT has been working on in the last few years is developing a professional outreach program. Right and make those connections and um, uh, hopefully uh, convince our uh, members uh, in the academy who are mainly dentists, but then also with this outreach to, to get to know these physicians and integrative practitioners, uh, to get them to familiar with, with our dentist members so that, yes, we can work together and collaborate. Because conversely, you want these physicians, mm -hmm. if they don't order it themselves, if they don't feel like dealing with it, to send you, the dentist, 100% of the patients that have had any chest pain at all mm -hmm. to get evaluated with the 3D cone beam because mm -hmm. the data is clear. Well over 90%, probably well over 90% of all heart attacks are directly caused, not related to, not associated with, mm -hmm. not linked to, not casually involved with, directly caused by focal infections in your mouth, disseminating and colonizing the coronary artery. Amen. So, Dr. Levy, on that note, let's conclude this podcast. I thank you very much for all the information you've provided us uh, and all your, your series of lectures to us over the years. My pleasure. And to our listeners and viewers, thank you very much for watching this, uh, this episode. And, uh, please go to uh, wordofmouth.iaomt.org for more podcasts that are available. Again, thank you very much. This podcast has been brought to you by the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, the IAOMT. The IAOMT strives for safer dentistry and a healthier world. We are a network of over 1,000 dentists, health professionals, and scientists who research dental products and practices including the risks of mercury fillings, fluoride, root canals, and jawbone osteonecrosis. We are a nonprofit organization and have been dedicated to our mission of protecting public health and the environment since we were founded in 1984. You can learn more about us at www.iaomt.org and www.thesmartchoice.com. The information provided on this video is not intended as medical advice and should not be interpreted as such. If you seek medical advice, please consult with a healthcare professional. Also, the information in this video represents the thoughts of the individual speakers and the views expressed in this interview do not necessarily reflect the views of the IAOMT 